Ah. How are you? Yeah. <laughs> right. well, nice to see you. Who are you? Oh, well, well. Good to see you. Well, well. Thank you. Thank you are you preparing your speech? No, I thought of it. Yeah. I was studying here. Yeah. I am from the, from the college and I was near, I stayed here as an assistant. Yeah. 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 A long time ago. I was here in uh, 1975. Uh, Seventy-six, oh, wow. and my wife seventy-four, seventy-five. Oh wow! Okay. So, so you're you're you're. But but you're living in Brussels. Yeah, we're living in Brussels. Oh, well, thank you so much for coming. No, we came, and I still. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, this is a new thing. You know, this is modern. But this is on you basically is it home trade and economy today or is it uh, transatlantic regulations as such? Which is a good question, actually. I was with somebody uh, the other day. Uh, and, uh, do you know Daniel Faraci? Uh, he is, uh, he is yeah. some NGO uh, in the US, and, and he is dialogue with both yeah. the yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and we started to talk about it. Uh, and I said, this is I still
<laughs> Good. Good afternoon. It's nice to see that we are all uh, gathered for a lively Friday afternoon talk. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, um, welcome uh, you all uh, to this uh, inaugural lecture uh, of our uh, new uh, chair, almost new, a few months uh, now. Um, first time ever that the college has uh, a chair on transatlantic affairs and connected with the MATA program. I'm very proud of that and I would like to thank Microsoft for sponsoring it and for having partnered with us in this journey. Uh, we were just saying before starting, when we started to imagine this, uh, we wouldn't have imagined how relevant uh, working on transatlantic uh, relations uh, would have been right now and probably even more so in the future. Uh, so uh, perfectly, perfect timing uh, and perfect investment, I would say, for us to work on this. And uh, I would uh, also like to recognize and thank the work that Michelle is doing in Mata, but uh, most importantly now uh, and here today uh, that Ian Lesser is, uh, uh, is, is doing with us uh, in, uh, in, with the chair uh, and, uh, and with the Mata courses. Um, we've been knowing each other and working together for quite some time, but I leave your presentation uh, to, to Michelle. Uh, let me just say a few words about, uh, um, about what we're discussing today um, and, uh, um, and the place of the college in all of that. Obviously, the college is, uh, um, uh, by definition, the center for European studies, uh, and this is what characterizes us. Everything we do has a European flavor. Uh, but I think that uh, um, working on transatlantic relations um, and studying the transatlantic relations and then working on them uh, is today an essential part of being European. Uh, it is so uh, today. I think we've seen it very clearly in this last uh, year and a half uh, in our joint response to uh, the Russian aggression towards Ukraine. We see this every day uh, when uh, um, it comes to how to uh, sustain or revitalize the multilateral uh, system, um, crises uh, that are uh, unfortunately uh, multiplying and intensifying around us, starting from the Middle East, uh, and the challenges that we see ahead of us uh, with uh, not only the European elections, the least of the challenges, but uh, mainly the, Euro the, the American elections uh, next year, that clearly give us a perspective of, uh, uh, of how to work on, transatlantic, uh, on the transatlantic bond whatever outcome will there be, uh, which is probably one of the main challenges that we will be studying and reflecting upon uh, in the coming months. Uh, knowing that, uh, hearing everybody in Washington and in Brussels, uh, uh, you would say uh, never as now, never before uh, US-EU relations have been so good, and I trust them. Uh, we'll hear more about that probably from Ian. Um, but also that some uh, of those that are diplomatically called irritants uh, are present and, uh, uh, and uh, not neglected. And uh, I believe that as in all partnerships and friendships and alliances, uh, they need to be addressed openly and frankly. Uh, and I think this is also part of our, uh, of our responsibilities and duties somehow here at the college to be honest both on the partnership and friendship side, but also on the difficulties uh, that can be addressed in an open and constructive manner on both sides. And this requires uh, knowledge. This requires uh, understanding of the complexity of the issues at stake uh, and uh, uh, deep knowledge. So uh, this is why I'm very happy to see uh, as many of you uh, today here, uh, even if the exam session is approaching. Uh, good. I'm sure that this lecture will also be helpful for your exams uh, and in general terms for advancing your understanding of uh, the global landscape and the transatlantic relations. Um, and I, um, I really believe that uh, it is, as I said, an integral part of being uh, good at understanding European affairs also being good at understanding and studying transatlantic affairs today. It's uh, somehow uh, an indispensable element, I believe, of our formation. So I'm proud that the college can offer that, and I'm proud that with today's lecture, we somehow formally inaugurate the works of the chair. With that, thank you again, and I leave the floor to Michelle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rector, for taking the time to welcome everybody to today's inaugural lecture of our Mata Chair in Transatlantic Trade and Economy. And I thank all of you for also spending the afternoon with us. 
It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ian Lesser, who is Vice President of the German Marshall Fund and a member of its executive team. He also serves as Executive Director of this Brussels office and leads the organization's work on transatlantic relations involving the Mediterranean and Turkey. And he has a long career on both sides of the Atlantic, and he was also educated on both sides of the Atlantic, including at our partner institution of the Fletcher School, in addition to the London School of Economics, and he would also received his doctorate from Oxford University. I'm delighted to introduce him today as a MATA Chair in Transatlantic Trade and Economy, and today he's going to go and deliver his lecture on transatlantic relations at a time of geopolitical and economic risk. So the way that we have structured today's session is we are first going to hear some remarks from Dr. Lesser, and then I'm going to go and ask a question or two. Then we'll open it up to our audience, both in the room as well as anyone that might be following online. For those of you that are online, then you should be able to go and see another screen where you're able to go and ask questions. But we really encourage your participation and your questions, and Dr. Lesser is also very eager to go and hear your perspectives. And and the questions that you might have about the transatlantic relationship. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ian Lester, the new MATA Chair in Transatlantic Trade and Economy. Well, Professor Chang, thank you, uh, Michelle, if I may. Thank you very, very much, and uh, Rector Mogherini. Um, you know, my thanks as well. I've just started in this role. It's, it's just a wonderful compliment to what I do uh, in other parts of the week, and uh, it's, it's really been a terrific opportunity to have a conversation with all of you. I know many of those who have been in the class or in, in the room I see, uh, but thank you very much for coming out to be part of this conversation. I really do want to make it that. I'm, I'm just going to speak for perhaps 15 minutes and then sit back down and we can have a conversation here and then open it up. Uh, to all of you. Um, you know, I, just to pick up on something that uh, the rector already said, I mean, this is, first of all, by almost any measure, the U.S. and Europe are the most important economic, diplomatic, security partners globally. I mean, this partnership is really at the core of whatever we think of the international system, whether it's functional or dysfunctional, this the relationship is at the core of it. And so there's a lot to talk about. Um, I don't think we can be complacent about it. Uh, there have been times when maybe fortunately we could be more or less complacent about the relationship, uh, but certainly that's not the world we're living in at the moment. We're not living in that world because of political developments on both sides of the Atlantic, but especially if I can say in my country, <laughs> we can talk about that, but also I would say clearly because of what's happening in the world. We're not in a time of security, obviously. Uh, and let me just share three, three sort of broad themes with you. I, I think they're, they're important to share and discuss, but also, I, you know, there's a, a sort of secret agenda in there too, which is that they're sort of the themes that I had thought of as, as driving uh, what I would like to work on in the context of the chair as well. Uh, and, and, but let me just mention these three to you. The first, and they're all at the nexus, I would say, of politics, security, and economics. Uh, so there's an economic piece there, but uh, as influenced by these other aspects. The first point I would make to you is simply that we're witnessing a very, very stark rise of geopolitical risk globally, uh, but also particularly affecting uh, the transatlantic relationship. And some of these sources of insecurity are old, but not all. Some of them are new. Uh, we ha we're living at a time of a war in Europe. Basic fact. Uh, also, one with, uh, sadly, very little prospect of near-term resolution. Um, we can talk a little bit about what some of the paths might be there, uh, but certainly the war in Ukraine uh, goes on, uh, is taking on the, some aspects of a stalemate. Uh, there's great support for Ukraine, obviously, on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, but there's also a lot of risk. You know, NATO has been very careful, I think, not to turn this into a war between NATO and Russia, particularly. Russia likes to see it that way, but uh, all of this depends on controlling the dynamics of escalation, which has more or less been the case so far, but it may not continue to be the case. I mean, one can really imagine um, things going wrong, accidents, escalation, misjudgments, things that uh, simply um, 
lead us in directions that we really don't want and escalation that we certainly wouldn't, certainly wouldn't want. I mean, one of the central ironies is that during the Cold War, certainly towards the end of the Cold War, there were all sorts of arrangements for strategic stability between then the Soviet Union and, and, and NATO, especially the United States. There were arms control agreements in place. There were arrangements to reduce risk in place, um, all sorts of things. All of that, almost all of it, is gone. Uh, when I worked at RAND for many years, which is a large think tank in California that worked on these issues, uh, we used to see our Soviet then, Soviet and then later Russian counterparts all the time. And we would go there, they would come to Santa Monica, they liked to come to Santa Monica. Uh, it's not surprising. But, and we more or less understood each other. We didn't agree always, but we understood what was stabilizing and what was destabilizing. And all of that is gone. We don't understand anymore. We don't really know what Russia wants. We don't, we can guess. Uh, they don't, I think, really understand what we want. They probably have a guess at that too. Uh, but that seems to me, if you take it together with the stalemate, is a very dangerous situation. It's not to say we shouldn't continue supporting Ukraine. I, I, I fully share that view. But uh, we need to be aware of the risks. And they're shared on both sides of the Atlantic. That's looking east. Um, from a European perspective in particular, but it's true for the United States too, there are also stakes in the south, when you look south from Europe. Um, this is a traditional area for the US to be involved in too. By the way, people forget the United States has been a Mediterranean power for over 200 years, actually. Um, but people don't often remember that, even in Washington. Um, with what's happening in the Middle East right now, obviously in Gaza, but also the potential for a spread of this terrible crisis as well, um, I don't think uh, either the EU or NATO can now afford not to look south in a more serious way. And we can talk about some of the connections between east and south, and, and there are some. Um, but I, I think it's a, just a luxury, a strategic luxury we can't afford anymore. People are going to have to think about what is this strategy in the south. And if the EU is going to have a, I mean, I hesitate even to, to mention this to you because you, you, you live this, but um, Rector, but you know, if the EU is going to be a more effective geopolitical actor in the world, many of the key tests are going to be in that region. They're going to be in the south, not just in the east. Um, the second point I would make to you uh, gets into the economic sphere. And I, here, I think there is also a kind of big risk, if I can put it that way. And that um, it's the rise of economic nationalism uh, on both sides of the Atlantic and also elsewhere around the world. Um, and I think this comes right up against this intention with this need for solidarity on the security front and in other ways across the Atlantic. Um, how do you have those strong alliance relationships when you're at odds over economic policy and, and, and uh, things like um, protectionism are back in vogue? And the truth is the state really is back in the economy on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, industrial policy is back. It goes under different names in different places. Some of it is quite understandable, and it's not new. Actually, I would say you could go trace it back to 2008 and the responses to the financial crisis, and then the COVID crisis recovery, uh, and all of that um, competition with China as it's seen from both sides of the Atlantic. But anyway, all of this taken together, uh, whether it goes under the name of tariffs or de-risking, or there are many different ways you could, you know, subsidies to the green economy, sometimes things that we would like to see happen, but are being subsidized in ways that, for example, Europe sees our uh, IRA, our Inflation Reduction Act, has nothing to do with inflation, but anyway, um, as, as basically protectionism. Um, and it, it is a bit of that even if, ironically, it's actually taking the United States in the direction on climate policy that most Europeans would like to see. So, um, but we have this, and it's a very strong impetus. I don't see it going away. Um, and it's troubling, because if you imagine a simultaneous deterioration of both geopolitics and economic relationships, that's not, to me, a good recipe for stability globally. And, and I'm actually a historian by, by training, and so you know, forgive me a little bit of, I, I don't want to be too glib about an analogy with the 1930s, but if we do go back and look at the 1930s, one of the key features of instability in the 1930s that led to the Second World War 
was actually this growth, this deterioration of economic relations at a time of geopolitical competition. Um, and it was a bit also a legacy of the First World War in which most of the, both the victors and the losers, uh, saw economics as having in some sense been critical to whatever happened. Uh, it's, it's quite a telling thing that between the two world wars, every major power, every major power had a Ministry of Economic Warfare, so-called. Um, and that, you know, we're not back to that in name perhaps, but I think we're back to that in some ways uh, in terms of strategy. Um, that kind of environment imposes costs on societies, even if it doesn't lead to conflict. But we have new costs coming, and it's an open question whether our societies are going to want to pay for them. Uh, the big new increases in defense spending that are being uh, planned. Uh, is Europe going to actually, are you going to want to do that? Um, our, our national service requirement, all these kinds of things that people had forgotten about. Um, are coming back, and, and they will have an effect on elections, they'll have an effect on, on all sorts of policies. I, I won't say too much about the American elections, because I suspect someone may ask about it. Um, but, but just to say that even on the front of, of, of trade, uh, Trump talks about a, 10 a blanket 10% tariff on all goods, imports in the United States. And this has been an extraordinary thing. I think it's an extremely negative thing. But, it's simp but, but the roots of this, in some ways, are there already. I mean, when Biden talks about a, you know, a foreign policy and an economic policy internationally for the middle class, I don't think it's very good terminology. But what does he really mean by that? And, and fair enough, people sometimes say this is kind of Trump economics light. Uh, certainly, there are many in Europe who would describe it that way. I, we, can, we can discuss it. F third point. Um, and this, this is a little bit different, but it's a kind of special interest of mine. And I hope next semester we can interest some of you in joining a compact seminar. I now have the vocabulary now, a compact seminar that we're planning to do on this. Um, and that is all about thinking about transatlantic relations, not just uh, on a kind of Washington-Brussels axis, as important as that is, but also for the rest of the Atlantic, north and south, including the southern Atlantic, if you like. Atlantic Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, with Europe and the United States, Canada, uh, Mexico. Um, these are Atlantic actors, but they're not usually thought of as part of this transatlantic relationship. And I think we need to sort of do some creative rethinking about our mental maps when it comes to transatlantic relations, and it should include that. Um, and it's doubly important now, I think, uh, because there is such a debate about the global south, if, we like to use that term, uh, but in any case, north-south relations, as they affect all sorts of things, um, there is an Atlantic piece to that, and I think we ought to be talking uh, about that. I, it, it, this matters, actually. If you look at what's going on in the world, so much of the energy is coming from what's happening in the south, in the Atlantic. Uh, the mega cities, the meta cities, uh, and all the governance and other demographic issues that go along with that, if you think about Mexico City or Lagos, uh, or Sao Paulo, um, you know, it's, it's in the South, the role of religion in the public space, what's happening there, much of that is in the South, uh, energy resources that are being developed in the South, partly as a response to insecurity, energy insecurity from the East, um, but that brings other public policy challenges as well. Connectivity, broadly, whether we're talking about digital connectivity, undersea cables and things of this nature, uh, but also ports, maritime cooperation, the blue economy, it just goes on. It's impossible, I think, to have that conversation without thinking about the rest of the Atlantic, the South Atlantic as well. So I think we need that broader conversation. I look forward to, to having that with you. Um, so let me just maybe uh, end by saying that, you know, it's, it's a sort of commonplace to say this is a challenging time. It's really a challenging time in transatlantic relations, but also in the world. It's very high stakes with what's happening in various settings, and we can talk about that. But it's also, I think, a time, again, and it goes back to, the, in a way, the theme of this chair, um, and it's interesting to me, how the nexus between politics, security, and economics, and how those things fit together, and what it will mean for all of us in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to be here with you and for the chair, um, and look forward to the conversation. So, 
I'm now going to sit down, Michelle, and look forward to talking. Thank you. So thank you very much for kicking off the event with such interesting reflections on transatlantic trade and economy, and especially that nexus between economics and security and uh, politics. And I'd like to go and p start by picking up on that. You had evoked the past when there was a Ministry of Economic Warfare. And so would you be able to go and elaborate a little bit on why you think this is relevant for us to recall at this time in history? I think you know it's worth it's worth just saying another word about why those uh, why that those ministries of economic warfare came into being. I mean, if the, it, it was very much about it didn't start with the First World War, uh, but it was very much about the outcome of the First World War, in which there were you know there were blockades, counter blockades, uh, attacks on economic resources. There was a feeling that um, that this was you know, in conditions of stalemate, this was really what mattered, that if you could strike somehow at the industrial capacity of, of adversaries uh, and bind together your own sort of allied economic systems, that this would convey a great advantage. And of course, it, it did in a sense. I mean, it, it, the, the allies were much stronger in that, in that sense. Um, and it also revealed a very great difference, and this is relevant today, between countries that saw uh, geoeconomics in terms of continental uh, direct access to things, autarky, uh, and countries that were willing to s see strength in international trade, the international economy, maritime links, and all this kind of thing. And there are distinct traditions about this, actually. I mean, the, the Russians are very much at one end of this. Uh, the Chinese are maybe at one end of this as well. Uh, Germany is at one end of it. Uh, France sort of in the middle, the UK, the United States at the sort of maritime uh, end, and there are a lot of, you could sort of think of a lot of different traditions. So it's deeply embedded in the background of countries that are thinking about these instruments today. I and mean, if you think about the role of economic sanctions, everyone reaches for economic sanctions first when there's a crisis. There are all sorts of reasons for that. The United States in particular is, is, is fond of that, partly because we see um, you know, economic stakes as being somehow key drivers of, of what happens in the world. And we could debate whether that's the right way to see it, but it's deeply embedded in the American sort of strategic tradition to see things that way. And there are other countries that see the things that way as well. But basically the idea was that in the future, countries were going to have to organize themselves for their own economic security and also somehow prepare to, to undermine, attack even, uh, the economic potential of others. Uh, and that, of course, played itself out in different ways in the Second World War as well. But it continued on into the, into the Cold War, where both sides uh, organized themselves explicitly. You know, you had Comic Con on one side and the OECD on the other uh, for this kind to wed together these economic relationships uh, explicitly. And that, that was, that, that's sort of where this comes from. We don't like to have, you know, the 30s, people called things what they were, unfortunately, sometimes. Um, there were ministries of war, departments of war. There was a war department in the United States, that's what it was called. I mean, that's not, doesn't sound good now to our ear, and probably for good reason. Um, but, you know, this is what it was about. It was how, how, you, would, how you would harness the, um, uh, your own sort of economic power and potential um, to either bolster or to reduce the power of others. It was seen as an integral part of international competition. I think, you know, we don't have the same vocabulary today, but I think in some ways we're kind of back to that. When people talk about de-risking, or decoupling. It's very much in that tradition. Okay, thank you. I would also like to ask about something that you'd already signaled within your talk and that somebody's going to ask you about the elections. And so I may as well kick that question off. <laughs> what would you like to know about the elections? <laughs> <laughs> well, the result, if you can swing that, but short of that, could you talk about the elections within the framework of the broader stability of the transatlantic relationship? When Rector Mogherini had begun her welcome, she had remarked on this particular moment as being, you know, rather a high point of transatlantic relations. And so how stable, how enduring do you see that, especially given the importance of that relationship globally, not only economically, but also politically, security? 
et cetera. No, thank you very much. I mean, look, I, I won't predict to you the outcome of the American election. What I will tell you is that it's surprising that it's even this kind of a competition. I mean, for all the reasons everyone follows this, and I, there's nothing more I'm really going to tell you about it. Um, but it's, 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 it's close. <laughs> And, uh, and if we were to, and we've seen a Trump administration, we saw what that was like. Um, I've now been in here in Brussels through three different administrate, four, three, uh, anyway. Obama, Trump, Biden, yeah. three. three, yeah, uh, three. Be here through a fourth. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, you see what different, different possibility, political outcomes uh, do. And, uh, and, and it, the U.S. president matters. I mean, the, the, we used to do some, well, we still do, this uh, Transatlantic Trends poll at, at GMF uh, that polls public opinion on both sides of the Atlantic. And one of the things that's very clear, if you look all over the years of all the results, is that the uh, character of the U.S. president is the leading driver of perceptions of the United States and Europe. Um, and, and those perceptions are very sticky. They're sort of unshakable. Um, very interesting. Um, if you go back even to the, the second Bush administration, um, the Bush administration, uh, very negative views in Europe. The second Bush administration actually in policy terms was much more amenable to European preferences. Made no difference. People still didn't like it. Um, Obama, Europeans loved Obama. He did very few of the things that Europe wanted him to do. They still loved him. And it affected views of the United States. Uh, and, it, and it sort of goes on like that. So it really does, it does matter. And also, if you know our system, there are so many political appointees in policy roles, not just ambassadorships, but if you get them confirmed, but policy roles, that it really makes a difference who is appointed and who the administration uh, chooses. Um, you know, this was, this was particularly difficult, I think, for Europe in the Trump years, because not only was Trump Trump, but also he appointed people that did not come from the known world, if I can say, uh, in terms of European policy interests, uh, whether it was about trade or security or other things, or climate certainly, or other things like that. So it would make a difference. And you know, all the speculation is that if Trump were to come back, it would be even more Trumpian than the first iteration for various reasons. Um, and he has very, at this point, tested preferences when it comes to things like trade and alliance relationships and things like that. So that, you know, this gets back to your second part of your question about what difference would it make because I think, to be honest, um, it is my personal view, but I think the Biden administration has been an extraordinarily good partner for Europe. It's not that we don't have differences on certain issues, but one of the very big differences, and this should matter to all of you here in particular, is that this administration, unlike almost any of its predecessors, takes the EU as an institution seriously, as an interlocutor. You know, it's not just that uh, President von der Leyen and President Biden have a close relationship. As an institution, the people who are in the government in Washington take the EU seriously as an interlocutor. Um, and there are many examples you can give about that. And so would that be the case with another administration? Possibly less so. Uh, it wasn't quite true with Obama not in the same way, anyway, or even in the Clinton administration. Um, certainly, Trump was disparaging of the EU institutions. He was also disparaging of NATO. And OK, structurally, these are different in the US system. You have a lot of supporters in the Senate, in particular, who value the alliance relationship. So there's a limit to how much you could do with that. But, um, but it does make a difference. And people are rightly worried about what what would happen. Um, I could go on, but just to say, I won't predict to you what happens, but Europe is a full stakeholder in the outcome. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you very much. I'd like to go and open it up to questions from our audience. Do people in the room have anything? We could go and start with a series of questions. So a few people go and ask, and then we can ask Dr. Lester to respond. So we're going to go and have someone with a microphone come over to people with a hand raised. Uh, thank you very much for, for your talk and congratulations for the opening of the chair. Um, I have a question about uh, technology policy. You mentioned the, the risk in strategy and I wanted to ask you, this is something that is being um, organized in the European Union nowadays in, towards China 
how do you think will be the outlook on the, the risking strategy in technology? Because we've seen that member states have different views on how to manage economic ties with China. We, we've seen the Commission thinks one thing and Germany and France thinks another thing. So how do you see the outlook on that? And if I may, a second question is about the, uh, your perspective on multilateralism in the future, because the, you paint a very a bad view on geopolitics and geoeconomics, and it sounds very depressing. So, how do you how do you think it will be the 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 way forward to construct more multilateralism in a world that is becoming more multipolar and states are uh, getting more confront confrontational in, in each other? Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Do we have any others that would like to go and ask a question? Um, yes, in the back. Yes. Hi, Professor Lesser. Thank you very much for uh, your talk and for being here with us today. Um, you mentioned the rise of economic nationalism and um, also Trump um, proposing um, this 10% border tariff on, um, on the U.S. borders. How do you assess the um, transatlantic project or the stated intentions of um, coming up with a carbon and steel club, which um, might be seen as an effort of bolstering up sustainability, but at the same time, could be economic nationalism in disguise, basically. And it builds a little bit on the, on the question of before. Um, is there any alternative to this economic nationalism or um, transatlanticism in a way? Um, thank you. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Do, do we could take one more question if we have one. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your speech. So whilst I'm in the politics department here, I'd love to hear your thoughts on IRA and how that might affect the EU's own response with strategic autonomy, open strategic autonomy, and some reflections on that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, some light questions on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, okay. Um, on, on tech policy, I mean, look, I mean, much of this does, as you, as you rightly sort of uh, hinted at, much of it revolves around, you know, views about China and exposure to China and how worried you should be about this. I mean, I think it's fair to say that there is a difference across the Atlantic in thinking about that. Um, there is a much more, you know, it's one of the very few things in Washington that Republicans and Democrats seem to agree on is a tougher line on China, uh, whether it's about security or it's about trade. Um, and so there, there is this thing about tech policy. You know, it's very easy in a sense, you know, in the United States to talk about tech policy when, you know, structurally the United States is very well set up in this sphere. I mean, we do very, very well about it. I mean, we have all of these concerns that's true about China and all the rest of it, but if you look, you know, at, at you know, the sort of patterns of, of innovation and entrepreneurship and, and all its startups and all of this kind of thing, that is, is driven by the tech sector. Um, the U.S. is doing pretty well in that regard, actually, um, globally. Um, and so, you know, I, I tend to think that in the U.S., much of this is it's less to do about economic competitiveness than it is about s security straight ahead. Uh, you know, uh, when the U.S. National Security Advisor talks about a small garden with high fences, what, he, what he, you know, he's sort of saying is that he wants to pick out um, you know, a selected number of technologies that are somehow critical to national security and, and in a way wall those off in terms of, um, of, um, of um, uh, you know, in terms of just, um, you know, kind of filtering out uh, investment relationships that, that we don't want in both directions. And, um, you know, in Europe, this is much more difficult territory. Uh, you know, European economies are much more dependent in many ways on the trade relationship, but not everywhere, uh, with China. But even here, obviously, attitudes have been hardening. I think that has a lot to do with how China talks about its role in the world and what it says and does, uh, but that's happening. But, you know, this de-risking business or decoupling, however you want to say, first of all, it's not so easy to do. And there are a lot of um, collateral sort of risks with this in different stakeholders in different places. I was in Taiwan not too long ago. Uh, and, you know, you would think if there's one place in the world that should worry about China, it's Taiwan. Well, you know, they struck me as much less worried about China than Washington is. Now, it's partly because they've just, 
Exactly. What are they going to do? They're used to it. They're there. It's a, rea it's a geographic reality for them. But it's also because their economies are so heavily intertwined that it's not possible for them to envision that kind of decoupling, nor do they want to see others do it. Because um, they, and it goes back to a point we were discussing earlier, <laughs> I think they rightly understand, without excusing anything about China's behavior in different regards, um, whether it's on human rights or other many things, um, that I would rather have uh, a relationship with China where you have this kind of interdependence. Uh, it makes people think twice um, at a time of rising nationalism. And if we don't have that, if that wanes, if, if that relationship uh, is less important, I think the, the, the bar to, you know, um, to more serious conflict with China is just lowered. Uh, and I think that's, that's, not, that's not really very useful. There is this Trade and Technology Council that's been set up across the Atlantic. It's met a couple of times. It's about to meet again. Um, I think the results so far have been, you know, let's say, modest. Uh, but it's good that the United States and Europe are talking about these things together uh, because we're in an atmosphere where that might not have been the case. Um, on the question about multilateralism, you know, I think there are countries around the world that are really, really skilled, multilateral, skilled at multilateral diplomacy. And many of them are actually in the global south. We can talk about whether that's a good term or not. But anyway, uh, certainly in the Atlantic south, you have countries like Brazil and Mexico and South, South Africa, they're very skilled at multilateral diplomacy. Uh, and, and they are feeling their weight in the world. Uh, you know, they are rejecting in different ways what they see as align the constraints of alignment and all of that. We're going to have to live with that uh, as the United States or, or Europe. Um, I, that's just the way the world is going. I don't think we can be, uh, you know, we need to be a little bit more flexible. Uh, but being flexible is, I think, in that case, going to be very often about um, you know, dealing with issues in a multilateral context. I mean, we could even talk about the current, you know, crisis in Gaza and the solution, what comes after, uh, you know, and the, and the multilateral aspect of that, which I think should be there and should be important. Um, so, I, you know, I don't think it's dead. Uh, I think it will take different forms, and I think there will be new actors that will really push it and be good at it. Um, on... Um, there was a sort of related question about Trump, I think, again, about, um, I'm not sure where that comes, it comes into almost everything. But anyway, I think, the, the, again, it, it plays off of this multilateralism question because I don't think the concern for Europe should be about American isolationism. Actually, the isolationist tradition in the United States is, 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 is actually not that strong. People use that terminology. What, what I worry about is American unilateralism which is a different thing. Trump isn't an isolationist, he's a unilateralist. You know, um, and we, we, we do have a tendency to do that. You know, our strategic tradition is a little bit, you know, this exceptionalism business and, you know, this, this absolutely splendid woman behind me used to talk about that. I mean, it, it worked kind of because she, she had a good approach. To what she was saying basically was, was you know, was right. Uh, but if it wasn't, it would have a different implication, that exceptionalism the essential state and all this. Um, so I think, you know, we should beware of unilateralism. Um, the carbon and, well, the aluminum, steel, carbon club, whatever you want to call it, it didn't really get off the ground. Uh, I, to, to my mind, and I'm not a specialist on that, but to my mind, that was a, an attempt to get some kind of a, a success that would stave off the return of these Trump era tariffs <laughs> Uh, because the bigger negotiation about trying to set those aside entirely wasn't going anywhere. Um, and, and so that's, you know, again, I think there is this central irony that much of this that Europe is concerned about is the consequence of the United States moving in a direction on climate policy and energy transition that Europe would actually like to see the United States move in. But we're doing it through, you know, a, a certain kind of... Um, approach that doesn't fit well with what Europe is doing. Uh, Europe has one approach, China has one approach, the United States has another. Uh, China is very uh, extremely activist on this, actually, but through basically state investment. Uh, the U.S. is getting there or wants to get there through subsidies. Uh, Europe has a different approach with CBAM and so forth. So, you know, reconciling all of that would be good. Would we even be in that place if we had TTIP? 
you know, the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership? Probably not. And I think it's a real shame that that didn't fly for all sorts of reasons, many of them on the American side too, honestly. Um, but there it is. Um, and then, well, IRA, we talked a little bit about that. Strategic autonomy. Uh, strategic autonomy. It, it, it depends what you're talking about. If you're talking about strategic autonomy in, in sort of um, tech and, and, and medical space and things like this, it has one implication. If you're talking about it in the security field, as the French often do, for example, it has another. Uh, I happen to be in that camp of Americans who think that some strategic autonomy, at least in that field, is not such a bad thing. I think if Europe is a more capable uh, foreign and security policy actor, that's a good thing. I think it's in America's interest. This is a terror. This is, in general, in the United States, seen as a, a you know, a sort of uh, the standard answer from the foreign policy establishment, what Obama used to call the blob. Um, you know, but it's true. I think honestly, um, you know, the U.S. has been a long-term investor and supporter of a European project, U U.S. uses that terminology, um, of different kinds, going back to the Marshall Plan and after and, and the creation of uh, European institutions. Um, look, I don't think there's anything wrong with this as long as it's not just an intellectual construct but actually something that Europe invests in, that, that actually has substance to it, especially on defense. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have other questions in the audience? And I would also remind those that are viewing online that you can ask questions through the Slido that is on the right part of your screen. But Antonia, I believe you had your hand up. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor Lesser. Um, so you mentioned the Trade and Technology Council and its potentially moderate success. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act, and this is one of the biggest criticisms of the council, wasn't actually addressed in the council uh, before it was announced. Um, how do you see potential alternatives to the council coming up and what would these look like? Okay, could we take a couple okay. of more questions before going back to um, Dr. Lesser? Yes. Thank you very much for your speech. Uh, my name is Clarice and I'm from the Paul Department. I just tend to disagree with you when you talk about the differences between the Trump and the Biden administration with regard to the transatlantic relationship. And I think there is a continuity, in fact, uh, in the foreign policy of the two administrations. Uh, we can talk about the Inflation Reduction Act or the AUKUS alliance or even the tariffs that Biden maintained that Trump had imposed. Do you think that the Biden administration is that much of a reliable partner for the EU? Thank you very much. Okay, and behind you, Yana, yes. Uh, hello, I'm Jakub, also from the Paul Department. I would like to ask you a question regarding the um, US position as regards the strategy of putting a wedge inside the member states in order to, I would say, increase the um, division between member states, how to perceive the transatlantic cooperation. Do you think that the next Trump administration, if it will happen, will use this strategy so as to basically minimize the uh, agreement between member states and using that strategy of putting a wedge between member states, for example, having in mind the French different um, perspectives or security defense and strategic autonomy, do you think that such, such strategy will be, um, I would say, utilized by the Americans? Thank you. Okay, and I had missed someone. Oh, yes. Hello, thank you um, for your for your introductory speech. Um, you mentioned um, that the U.S. is a major in power, and I would like to to ask you that we have to. You just mentioned that we have to rethink about the policy. And what would be like the next one? I would like you to explain or go further on what would be like the key um, elements that we should revise, and also if the EU and the US should uh, work together in 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 this new strategy. Thank you. Okay, and we can go and take um, hers as well, since she also had her hand up. So. Um, thank you, Professor, for your speech. I wanted to ask you actually on one of the greatest regulatory challenge that we see today, which is artificial intelligence. And I personally do not believe in an EU-only solution. And I was wondering uh, if we could hear your takes on the potential 
for a US EU um, uh, emergence of, um, of a normative regulatory standards regarding artificial intelligence. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We'd like to go and respond. <laughs> sure. Thank you. <laughs> um, look, alternatives to the Trade and Technology Council, I, 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 don't, I don't know that I need to, to, I'm not sure what those would be exactly. Uh, I think the point is to, to make it work and give it content and, as you say, uh, to bring the key issues to that space. Uh, whether it's raised there or raised in other, you know, at higher levels with the, with the EU, why the, you know, Europe, Europe should have been surprised by the IRA, I'm slightly befuddled because, yes, it wasn't a, a source of discussion in the Trade and Technology Council, but it was very clear that the politics of that kind of investment in the United States would absolutely have required the kinds of concessions that were made to people who were very hard over about this in, in the U.S. Congress. I mean, you know, there are a lot of Europe, in general, has a very sophisticated understanding of American politics uh, for good reason. Um, so none of this should have been surprising. But, I mean, the question is a very good one, but it also, I think, highlights the fact that behind all of this, we can have sort of, you know, technical discussions about the regulatory issues uh, and other things, uh, and that's very useful. We should be doing that. But if we don't have this fundamental political conversation at quite high levels, uh, it's, it's simply not going to work. And I think it's, it's in a way evidence, evidence of that. And the closer we get to an election, uh, the more difficult it becomes. Um, you know, um, that's, that would be my thought on that. Um, continuity, Trump, Biden. Well, you know, it's a good question. I mean, I like to say that there isn't that much, but I can well understand when people make this point where that comes from. Now, especially if you're looking at things like some trade and some regulatory issues and so on, uh, things that were put in place by Trump, and some of them had even started at least as debates under Obama, um, it's hard to dismantle. I mean, I think this administration would have liked to do something different with the steel and aluminum uh, tariffs, but it hasn't been any rush to change it, uh, really, and it's not been easy to do politically. And again, as you get closer to an election, it gets harder to do. I mean, there are people in Europe who will say that this economic nationalism Nobody calls it that, but that's sort of what it is. Um, existed in one very vigorous, very um, uh, explicit form under Trump. I mean, if you go back to his inaugural address, actually, he talked you know, about this at length in a very troubling way. Um, but, but he was consistent about it. Um, Biden, you know, has used different vocabulary and it hedged about in foreign policy for the middle class and all of that. I still don't know what that means. But anyway, foreign policy for the middle class, and I tend to support them on many things. I still don't know what that means. But, but what, if I am pressed to decode it, it means exactly that. It means a kind of lighter version of this economic nationalism. Uh, because it's about jobs at the end of the day. Uh, and that's how it's that's how it's described. So I can I can understand where that view comes from. But on so many other things, especially this idea of who do you talk to in Europe, and does it matter? The Biden administration is on a different planet from Trump. And if Trump were to come back, it would be another thing entirely. So, you know, uh, you know I take the question. I understand where it comes from. I, I just think there is a fundamental difference. Um, wedges, with the U.S., you know, driving wedges in Europe, you, you know, I, I don't think, certainly looking at this administration, I don't think they're really interested in that. They have their preferences. There are, I mean, there's no question what the United States wanted to see from the Polish elections, say, or their view about uh, Hungary, or many things like this. Um, on strategic autonomy in France and, you know, um, they have issues with, with different, you know, Germany, they want Germany to do more. Uh, Fran actually, the, the, the relationship between France and the United States, it, it, it's actually quite good in many ways. You know, it, in fact, if you look at what is actually done around the world, especially in the security space, France is, is probably um, America's leading defense partner around the world, and vice versa. 
Uh, sometimes our, we don't talk about it in that way, but, but it, it's, you know, we're just doing an enormous amount together. Actually, and the military has worked very well together. So in many of these spaces where France, you know, presses for more autonomy, I think the view in, in Washington now is, okay, that's, that's fine, but you actually have to invest in it and do it, and, and, and it'll be in our interest if you do that, if Europe spends more and does more. Um, so I don't think we're, but I don't think if you use that wedge terminology, that question, really goes back to this time when we talked about an old Europe and a new Europe, uh, and the fact that the United States could somehow had more affinity, could get more done with, with Central and Eastern Europe, because they didn't bring all this baggage, they brought other baggage, but anyway, it was more congenial baggage, and, uh, but that was, you know, a Bush administration thing in many ways. The, the Biden administration doesn't talk about if anything, they were all about uh, renovating the relationships with core, key, traditional Western European partners and dealing with European institutions because they matter. Um, you know, when they go out and want to talk about sanctions policy on Russia over Ukraine or export controls, the first place they go is to talk to Europe, talk to the Commission, talk to von der Leyen's cabinet, talk to that. That's where this is being done basically, uh, and also national capitals. That would not have been the case with other administrations, I think, e even to some democratic ones. Um, the question about, you know, the strategy south and, and, and things like this, and, you know, the, the, the U.S., you know, we're a funny sort of actor in this respect. I mean, we're a long-term actor in the Mediterranean. You can see now what's happening uh, even today. There's a, much more evidence of this. I think there's great mythology about American disengagement from the Middle East and North Africa, from the Middle East generally. Um, I, I'm not sure where that comes from, but it's there. I, I, I know where it comes from. I mean, the American disillusionment with engagement in Afghanistan and in, and in, uh, in Iraq in particular. Um, but, but that shouldn't be confused with a lack of interest or a lack of presence or diplomacy uh, or aid. <laughs> or many other things, um, it's, it's there. But you know, this is one of the key places where, if you look around the world, European and American capacity to engage is actually rather balanced. It, that's not necessarily been so vis-a-vis -a, -vis a nuclear armed adversary in the East, where obviously the US brings certain things that Europe, or certain, most of Europe doesn't. Um, it's not true in Asia where the U.S. is a major strategic actor, but Europe is obviously a major economic actor, but not, doesn't have the same capacity to project power. In the Mediterranean, this is Europe's near abroad. And so in some ways, it, it's, it's key tests for the partnership, or if you want to do more between the EU and NATO, this is the place it's going to happen. Uh, because you have this mix of hard and soft security uh, problems. Um, all sorts of reasons, it seems to me, and then the, you've got the counterterrorism agenda and the migration agenda. These are highly politicized for different reasons. And just finally, if I can say, even on migration, uh, this seems to be yeah, it's a European public policy issue, clearly. We have our own in the Western Hemisphere, um, and it's no less difficult politically. But the U.S. is a stakeholder in what Europe does on the migration front because it is such a polarizing issue and such a driver, especially of populist politics in Europe. And many of and those populist election outcomes in Europe, you know, are, are something that the United States needs to be concerned about because most of those um, political actors, political movements um, fueled by migration concerns are not particularly Atlanticist. And if you had them in power, in France, say, or in Germany, that would be very, very difficult for the transatlantic relationship, or at least for this transatlantic relationship under this administration. Um, what, uh, you know, I'm not going to speculate about other. Uh, for me, I, I would find that troubling. So, so we're a stakeholder. But it's all in the South. OK, if we could just take our final question from on our online audience, Pablo? Yeah, so we have a question from the online audience, and it is about NATO and the EU. So the question is, how might NATO and the EU strategically pivot towards addressing challenges in the southern countries, and if there are any concrete measures that can be taken? 
Yeah, no, I mean, you know, that's very much follows on from what I was just saying about uh, the strategy southward. I think if, if there's going to be more attention to the south, and I, I think it's inevitable now, for perhaps for the wrong reasons now, but anyway, we have what it is what it is, um, that it, 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 there has to be that connection between NATO and the European Union, um, because there is this mix of challenges. Uh, some that NATO is obviously geared to address uh, that have to do with hard security, that have to do with, uh, with, um, with uh, training and equipment and technology in the defense sphere, uh, with uh, security-related partnerships in, in a hard sense, you know. Um, th this is NATO stuff. Uh, but when it comes to maritime security, when it comes to uh, uh, civil military relations, reform of the security sector, um, uh, aid and assistance as a contributor to stability. Um, a whole, it, it's a long list. Uh, these, this is, this is e, these are EU competencies in many ways. Um, and, and it would be foolish not to take advantage of that. I think at the high political level now, anyway, um, uh, there is, is quite a commitment to doing more in this space. That hasn't always been so, perhaps, uh, but I think it's definitely there. A lot of this has to do with just the people who are in these positions uh, talk to each other and have those relationships. And they invite each other to this, their summits and so forth. Um, but it, that does tend to trickle down eventually, one hopes, to those bureaucracies uh, where it's a little tougher sometimes, I think. Um, but I think it's absolutely required. I, and very much in the American interest to see this happen, actually. Okay, thank you very much. So before we, oh, please. Uh, I, I would just like to, to jump in on uh, on the question about continuity or discontinuity about uh, uh, about the administrations. Uh, I've been lived through uh, the two two of them only, two and a half, uh, and and looking forward a bit. Uh, and I think this is really the essence of what makes the transatlantic partnership strong. At the end of the day, that regardless of the ups and downs and the continuity or discontinuity, there is a basis for for cooperation that stays that goes beyond the institutions and the politics, which is based on um, the cities, the people, academia, trade, uh, communities, uh, tech, uh, and so on, investments, and, and so on and so forth. But I think that we are seeing a trend uh, that is not only an American trend, it's actually a trend also in Europe and worldwide about this uh, interpretation of the economic power as the geopolitical power which actually I think should be questioned because if you see the role of Russia, uh, it's clearly not an economic power that is projected there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that we should have some question marks about whether uh, the economic power translates into geopolitical power. Uh, but it is the common sense that economic power translates into geopolitical power today. And this translates then domestically in the US, but also across Europe, I think, and in many other parts of the world into this as you called in very um, candid uh, ways, uh, forms of protectionism or forms of, um, you, can, you can call it America first, which is not a problem in itself because it's a duty and responsibility of everyone that has government positions to put his or her own countries first. The problem is only or, or not. It can be first and only, or it can be first together with others. It's a little bit the same thing with strategic autonomy, open or not, cooperative or not. Uh, this to say that I think there is a trend in the US, but also elsewhere, to put much more at the center also of uh, international uh, relations, including the transatlantic partnership, domestic considerations. Uh, and I guess that is uh, the uh, foreign policy for the middle class uh, reading about that. Uh, and to read the international relations, including transatlantic partnership, in terms of what does it mean for my domestic audience? What does it mean for my domestic dynamics? And I think that this is a constant thread uh, across different administrations and that this will stay. And this is why I was not too surprised when I saw that some decisions were not discussed, for instance, at the Council, uh, or, I mean, we didn't mention the decision to uh, pull troops out of Afghanistan, um, another thing that was not discussed in NATO, or was communicated in NATO, but not necessarily taken a decision together. So I think that there is this 
national approach to foreign policy decisions. Uh, that is a consolidated trend. But I agree with you very much, Jan. There is a fundamental difference. There has been a fundamental difference uh, between the Trump administration and the Biden administration. And that is indeed the uh, attitude towards Europe. Mm -hmm. Uh, not only towards Europe, but towards the European Union specifically. Uh, and, and I have to say also the Obama administration had that. Probably the Biden administration is even more uh, focused on the role of the European Union, but the, the Obama administration, especially in the years of the Brexit referendum, was very much supporting the European Union as such. Trump, the Trump administration had as, as one of its own objectives that are clearly stated, that of dismantling the European Union as much as possible. Uh, the divide et impera, uh, divide and rule, that was part of clearly the policy uh, of, of the administration. And this is something that uh, neither the Obama administration nor the Biden administration absolutely mm, vote at all. So that was an essential uh, element of difference for the European Union, um, that the choice is to go through the European Union. For instance, Trump was not even aware that trade was a European competence. Uh, and, and, and it was even trying to, to negotiate bilateral trade agreements with member states. Uh, now, you laugh, but at the time we were not laughing at all. Uh, so th there is in, in the Biden administration I think, a, a profound recognition of uh, and knowledge of the competences, of the reasons, of the history, and of the capacity of the European Union as such. Uh, and I think that this is what makes the real difference uh, when it comes to the partnership that goes beyond the trends that we are seeing on economy and, and foreign policy. Yeah. May I just, no, no, thank you very much for that, Director. I, I, I you know, I mean, you put it very well. I think one of the things that you, which you mentioned cities briefly, I, that occurred to me with this is that, you know, one, one of the, um, one of the lessons, if you like, anyway, one of the facets of the experience under Trump across the Atlantic was that, you know, at least on certain issues, if the administration in Washington is not on the same page and you have difficulty dealing with them, there are other actors in the United States that are part of this transatlantic relationship. Um, the private sector, civil society, cities, states. Uh, now, if you're talking about arms control agreements, it's not very useful if you're talking about certain kinds of things. But if you're talking about climate policy or you're talking about tech policy or you're talking about regulation, someone asked about that, and I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't come back to that question uh, directly, but um, there, you know, there are other actors who really matter, actually. Uh, and I think, you know, wherever this goes, uh, th those, are, even under a democratic administration, those are in fact important facets of, of the relationship across the Atlantic. Um, you know, maybe just one final word, which is that y it also matters what people think. And um, it's very interesting. We were charting at GMF for many years this, um, this sort of trajectory of public opinion when it comes to, you know, what how people saw the transatlantic relationship in terms of their own life, whether how important was it. And we asked this question for some years. And there was a very clear trend on one side of the Atlantic in the United States, which was not mir mirrored in Europe. Uh, in the US, if you ask people that question, uh, their answers tended to be driven by their age, very, very clearly. The, the younger Americans were, the younger cohorts uh, tended to see uh, Asia and the Pacific as more important to their future for better or for worse. I mean, it wasn't a comment about affinity. It was something else. Uh, and, and Europe less so. Uh, older generations were focused on Europe. In Europe, if you ask the question, it did not matter. The, the relationship with the United States was still at the top. So I'm pleased to be in this audience rather than in the other one. But, but anyway, thank you very, very much. OK, so before we close, I would like to go and thank the people that helped make this possible, including our sponsors at Microsoft, our Mata team, um, Pablo, Belinda, and um, Yana. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Yes, I, and I meant to say that. <laughs> our friends in communications also for helping get the word out before and after the event. So thank you very much for being here, Benedict. And of course, to our panel here with Dr. Lesser, Rector Mogherini, and for your participation as well. I'd like to now invite all of you downstairs into the foyer for a small reception, and perhaps you could go and continue some of this conversation there. But in the meantime, thank you very much for coming.